come to this um, epoch making event. Uh, uh, that's the first of its kind in the Department of Industrial and Production Engineering. Uh, with the classic song of Louis Daniel Armstrong, I welcome you to the uh, IPEA lecture series. Uh, thank you for watching wherever you are all over the world. This is the maiden edition, and I'm very sure um, we're going to have a swell and good time among ourselves. Uh, my name is Baba Tundi Ode Dairu, and I will be the moderator for today's uh, um, program. Uh, today we'll be having a lecture from one of us, who is also uh, a former student uh, um, engineer, Olatunde Abe. He will be uh, speaking on um, from industrial engineering to data engineering, you know, uh, calibrating your engineering career. Uh, before that, I would like to just say one or two things for, you know, just like a housekeeping. Ruth, kindly make sure you meet your um, device uh, while the lecture is ongoing and be sure that this event is being screened, it's being streamed rather live on YouTube and also uh, we're recording it for post lecture viewing for those that are not able to make it. And uh, you'll be, you know, there are so many things along, uh, there are so many things, uh, there are so many things that will come along, but uh, I'm very sure that uh, we all have a wonderful time uh, with our guest speaker. So moving along, uh, uh, I want our uh, our chairman, the IPA, uh, I will call him a, a President General. Uh, I hope you allow that uh, to have his um, uh, opening remark. Uh, before I ask him to come up, uh, come upon, I will want to say one or two things about him. This is a uh, industrial engineer with a strong entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, if you if you go on his website or on his personal and those company website, which is the Alpha Mean in health, in facility uh, facility management, in security, in, uh, um, in in finance across Africa and in the Middle East, you know they are doing wonderful things, and he has been so 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 supportive of uh, um, industrial engineering or the Faculty of Tech, as well as IPAA. So uh, without much further ado, I would like to. Call on Engineer Femi Akintunde, sir, to give your opening remark. Sir, you can share your screen and let's have your opening remarks, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Engineer I really appreciate this opportunity today. And um, let me first start by saying that um, at the lunch at the airport, I'm actually on my way out of uh, the country. Uh, uh, but given the importance of this very, very uh, event, I have squeezed that time to spend these five minutes to give the opening remark. However, um, I have been able to uh, speak with uh, one of our very senior executives in the company, who is the managing director of our real estate development company, uh, to stand in for me. Uh, as a chair, Mrs. Wale Odufalu. Uh, she will be taking uh, over uh, the chairmanship role that you have graciously uh, asked me to perform this afternoon. Um, having said that, I'd like to thank the lecturers, our, our faculty members. I'd like to thank uh, our colleagues who have been able to put this very important event together. Um, it's a pop uh, making event, and I really, really appreciate the efforts they have put into it. I like the energy, the positive energy, the vibe that I see among our members these days. And it really, really tells me that IE is ready to take uh, a very, very prominent position in advocacy, in promoting the welfare and good uh, will for all our members. Uh, across the world and uh, in Nigeria, students, lecturers, and those of us in business. Uh, through this platform, collaboration will improve and we will be able to take it up. This initiative is commendable and is one out of the many that we have been trying to uh, put in place over the years. And this will really make it easy with the people who are showing interest now, we are going to get ourselves together to do more. 
Um, without going too far into detail of what our uh, speaker will be talking on today, I'd like to just put a perspective to this very important uh, topic. And I know it is something that is very germane, it's a very important topic at this point in time. Uh, industrial engineering uh, to detail engineering, collaborate, I mean, calibrating your engineering career. This is very, very important. And if you look at our profession, industrial engineering, what it teaches us is about productivity. We are the productivity evangelists. And in productivity, what you are trying to do is to minimize your input and maximize your output. However, in an environment where things are very, very difficult, um, it is very important for us to know what are the dimensions. And this has been, this kind of period we are in now, this environment has been described uh, in the uh, management world with a four letter acronym called VUCA, V-U-C-A. So this period, starting from the time that we had COVID with the various shocks to this present moment with the Ukraine and the Russia world, the world, the business environment and the business world has not yet stabilized. What does VUCA mean? And I believe it is a time for us to see how we're going to become more detailed in what we do. And the necessity for that is described by the VUCA. V stands for volatility. Everywhere is volatile now. U is uncertainty. C is complexity. And A is ambiguity. This four letter word describe the world we are living in today. And how to adjust speaks to another VUCA, which says you must have clear vision, which is the first V of the solution. The U is understanding the environment because you cannot prefer solution, detailed engineering solution to a problem you do not clearly understand and your vision is not clear about. And the C is clarity. With your vision, you have to ensure it is very clear. And with the clarity also comes the compassionate part of leadership. Why the A, the A part of it is agility. Once you have a clear vision, you understand the environment, you understand the issues and the challenges you want to deal with, and you have compassion to lead others. The last, which is the A, is agility. You must swing to action immediately because speed to market is very important to achieve your objective in a very effective manner and not spending too much to achieve so much. So on this note, ladies and gentlemen, I know we are very, very prepared to, today to listen to our very, very uh, able speaker, engineer Abi Olatunde, uh, who I know has prepared very well. And before my flight takes off, I will also listen in uh, while I would may not, not be able to play the chairmanship role, which my colleague, Mrs. Walio Dufalu, will take from here. Uh, and I would like on this note to thank everybody for being part of this event. And I look forward to how much engagement and how much contribution we will all be able to make to make it as interesting and as engaging as we can make it so that we come out of it and we look forward to having the one for next month because this is gonna be a monthly event. And like I said, it's one of the initiatives, new ideas that we'll be introducing. And I'm very happy for those who have taken this initiative, we will support it, we will grow it, we will enhance it and make it to the benefit of everybody. Once again, I thank you all. And I wish all of us a very successful and enjoyable deliberation today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. We, we appreciate uh, your, your talk. Um, thank you for your kind words. Thank you for the support for ISA once again, the support for the Faculty of Tech. And then um, I, I can remember vividly that uh, three of our students, I think Josephine, um, Abbas, and Adiwali were one time either IT student and even full time students too. Uh, sorry, full time staff uh, at your company. Thank you so much for the uh, ever present support to the Department of Industrial and Production. Thank you so much, sir. While you are uh, still with us, um, I hope you will enjoy the rest of uh, before your uh, flight takes off. Uh, still moving on, uh, on in the program, 
Um, you all agree with me that uh, we have a platform. Without a platform, we can't be here. All of us were bound by one, and that platform is uh, the University of Ibadan. That's the Premier University. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, join me. Uh, you know, with us here, I'm happy to uh, you know to inform me that we have the 13th Vice uh, uh, Chancellor of the Premier University, University of um, Ibadan, uh, and that is a uh, professor. Before I mention his name, let me just say he is a professor of chemistry and he has over 30 years you know, of experience. So uh, I would say join me in welcoming uh, Professor Kayo De Oyebode at uh, Wali for his uh, uh, good message. Sir, what is your sir? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, the compare. It's, it's a privilege for me to be with you this afternoon. I feel uh, highly honored and um, I'm very excited. Uh, I'm excited even beyond the, the disciplines, the discipline of um, uh, industrial and production engineering, because uh, my feeling is that uh, this type of forum will allow you know, us you know, to be able to network and network properly. You know that the uh, University of Ibadan was established in 1948. And I know that uh, if we want to, you know, harvest all the alumni that we have in, in that are passed out of this university, uh, this whole campus will be filled with people. But unfortunately for us, it appears that uh, we just exist, you know, uh, in silo. We are not able to handshake with ourselves. We are not able to, you know, mix with ourselves. We are not able to, you know, do a lot of things together because I know that uh, a single broom, it will be difficult for it to clean a place. But when you put them together, there are so many things. So apart from uh, the discipline, the discipline of um, uh, engineering, that uh, I know that uh, this particular forum, you know, will um, help us to understand and to appreciate more. Well, I know that you know we have our alumni association. Apart from that, we have the alumni community. If you look at the ratio of alumni association, alumni association are those ones that belong to an association, you know, uh, and uh, they are alumni. But we have the alumni community that have not been touched at all. Uh, they, they are still, uh, they are passed out of this university. But unfortunately, because they exist separately as separate entities, there are so many things that they are doing separately. We do not harvest them. They have programs, not only in this country, Nigeria, but all over the world, they meet, but they don't even have any handshake, even with the parent university, the, the University of Ibadan. So when I came in you know, last year, in November, November 2021, we want to try to stratify our alumni, to stratify them in form of classes, so that we have a class of a particular year that they entered a class of 1967, a class of 1968, and so on and so forth. So if we have them, you know, in strata like that, it becomes easier for us, you know, to be able to reach out to each other. And it will not be difficult to call ourselves together, even if we needed to plow back. Because if you see now the way, I hope I'm not taking a lot of time. I will soon, um, I will soon leave. If we continue the way we are continuing, it will be difficult for us even to be able to plow back to the university because it's becoming very clear, not only you know, to everyone in the country, but also to government itself, that government alone cannot fund higher education. Higher education extends much, much, much more, more than that. And the groups of people, you know, that can help higher education, that can help the universities, are these groups of alumni. But 
you cannot go to an, um, an alumni if you have not really cultivated them, if you have not really shown you know, to them what the university also have in benefits. So uh, I, don't, let me, don't let me talk too much, but what I just want to inform us, my thinking is that um, Professor uh, Olama Kindi Olakwekba will be able to join us. Unfortunately, perhaps he's very busy somewhere. He's uh, the university, you know, uh, alumni relations officer. It's an office that has just been created and it is direct, directed to try to stratify our alumni and bring them into focus as classes so that we'll be able to reach out to them, not only in Nigeria, physically, but also in any part of the world of which uh, we are prepared to do. So on that note, let me appreciate uh, the people that have put this together. And let me assure you and that whatsoever that the university can do to be able to sustain this, I, will, I heard from uh, the chairman uh, who was saying that, you know, this meeting is going to be a monthly meeting. I just love it like that. Whatsoever that we can do, that the university can do to sustain it in terms of sustainability, continuous sustainability, be sure that the university will do that. We will handshake with anyone, we will handshake with any group to make this, you know, uh, this forum, this type of monthly lecture, you know, to be continuous so that it will be unbroken. We'll make it continuous like that. And if even other departments will be able to join like this, it will be easy for us to reach out to each other. So let me just appreciate everyone that is on this forum. I don't know how many of us are here. I want to appreciate you. Take time and sit back so that we'll be able to enjoy. Unfortunately, I have another meeting now. I left a meeting to be able to join this because I made it a priority that I will definitely, you know, stay until I give, uh, you know, this good message. So I appreciate everyone that is on, on this and I wish you very fruitful deliberation. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir, for your good message. And uh, I think Professor Lapigba also is on board. You are welcome, yeah. sir. Yeah, he's also on board. Um, ah, if you can just say some very few all, words. I've all said right, all sir. the things that you need to say. But if you say some uh, very few words, it will also be able to complement what. Uh, don't worry about protocol. Right, let's, sir. let's thank you so much, sir. <laughs> because right, the vice chancellor speaks last. <laughs> <laughs> Professor so, Lakweba. Uh, Mr. Vassan, sir. I broke protocol because of you, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate you, sir. Well, I'm actually in the back room uh, on my way from Hussein, but I joined right from the beginning. Uh, well, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to take much time. Uh, you spoke very well, sir. But just to alert our alumni that we, we have them in mind. And of course, this is the picture of the Vice Chancellor to bring the alumni. Uh, as a first lady, uh, you had you had 2002 up to uh, you had 2022. That is 20 years. Yes. Then after we begin to work backward, we, we yes. want yes. the alumni to know that the university cannot yes. really really run. Uh, Without the input of the alumni, we want to partner with us uh, to to make your alma mater uh, a greater place. At least better than uh, you left it. You are in a, you are in a thought. We are mindful of. A contribution to the university, uh, not only in terms of, of cash. Yeah. Is that one of this to be a contact point for the alum for the alumni worldwide? Once you make it, you can then contact. OK, 
Okay. All right. I think um, maybe if you can um, stop your video, sir, oh, because of oh, the oh, bandwidth, oh, so that we can oh, hear you very well. For you. Okay. All right, sir. If you are still with us, sir, maybe uh, before the end of the program, we we'll still we we'll still bring you on. Sir, sir, you have your parting shot for us, sir. Before you go, okay, all right, okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, we appreciate uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor. We thank you, sir, for at least for the promises, and we know you keep your words. Um, moving on, I think we are getting closer. Um, before we get to the main lecture itself. Uh, we need to know our speaker, we need to know engineer Latunde Abi. And to do that is, um, you know, funny things here, one, uh, uh, his classmate is going to, you know, uh, read his citation. And also uh, she's an um, engineer, Mrs. Greer, and they're also doing very well in her choosing career. So, but one important thing is that they're in the same class together back then. Uh, so if I call engineer, Gloria to come on board and read the citation for us. Yeah, thank you, ma. You can share your screen, please. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> this is Gloria IDMG Neomagi, uh, class 2004 for BSc and 2013 for MSc Industrial Production Engineering. It's a privilege, really, to speak about Olatunde Peter Abbey, a colleague. Nice to have you here as our guest lecturer. So I'll just read his citation because I, I seem to be having this issue on my system. So I'll just read it out. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, I just needed that feedback. Okay, Olatunde Peter Abbey is a detailed engineer with skills and experience in the front end and detailed engineering of facilities, as well as in design, development, and manufacture of engineering components and consumer products. He deploys digital tools, including 3D models, modeling, programming with applicable industry codes and standards to ensure that your project is safe, buildable, and fit for purpose. Ola had a, an early start in design, especially in the design practice, which culminated in several years as an apprentice. He was also a designer, fabricator in um, Critical Hope, Nigeria Limited. He has built experiences over the years. He has developed several solutions spanning from simplifying and improving manufacturing while working as a consultant for several technology-driven manufacturing businesses. He's a graduate of industrial and production engineering. And then after an initial 12 years intensive in the design and fabrication of steel and aluminum products, he has added 14 years experience in the oil and gas industry, where he perfected his skills in design detail working on major projects, including lead structural designer for NLNG, seven feed project, fabrication sites, lead also JV repair projects. He was also a technical writer for MTN Nigeria knowledge management projects and so much more. In fact, he has acquired so much. experience. He's currently the CEO of Apps Engineering Works Limited, Deep Space Africa Limited, and Locomo Alpha Tech Limited. These businesses target specific sectors of the Nigerian manufacturing space, usually through strategic partnership. He's a member of the Council of Registered Engineers in Nigeria, that's current and the Nigerian Society of Engineers, NSC. Thank you so much. We know we'll gain so much from the lecture today. 
I just want everybody to sit back and enjoy and let's hear the details of detail engineering. Thank you. All right, thank you, engineer, Mrs. Gloria. Without further, uh, without a further ado, uh, engineer Latunde, I think there's a Peter B there. Am I correct, sir? Or Latunde yes, Peter B. Peter. All right, so can you kindly share your screen? And, and I hope um, we can also please ensure that we put our devices on mute or vibration for us to all enjoy this. Thank you. Yeah, you can start, sir. Um, good evening. Um, it's so glad, it's, it's so nice to be back home. Um, I have so many fond memories of industrial engineering and I just can't go away. But at the same time, I'd like to note that this is a setup um, in light of the fact that I know there are several uh, more qualified engineers than myself. And But it's so nice to be back home, like I said. Um, thank you. So um, today we just want to look at uh, industrial engineering and going, how did I transit from being an industrial engineer basic to detail engineering, which is um, a sought out field really, and what other opportunities exist. Um, one of the things that triggered this um, thinking is why even as far back as my undergraduate days, we had people that said, oh, industrial engineering is useless. Industrial engineering is not relevant. I, in fact, there is um, there's actually somebody who has a PhD now, um, and that was his assertion as a tone level, and we had to sit down and have those discussions. And it's wonderful to be an IE, really. And how can we calibrate our careers to increase our relevance, to increase our industrial penetration, and essentially our value, both in Nigeria and outside the country? I'd like to note. The original spark, um, aside of the several inputs from the qualified and eminent um, leadership from the department, I have I've, I've seen universities, I've, I've hardly seen people that dedicated to their students. That's the truth. So, but the original spark that put me on the higher or faster track trajectory was this presentation by Professor Bamiro. Um, I think it was an ISR presentation, and that I think it was 2001 or 2002. So um, Professor was talking about the projects they did at um, QLink Consult or so, and he was discussing how they use computers and programs. They wrote programs to improve the operation at Lafarge. When I saw that, I said, wow, so computers can be so useful. I must get a computer. I think I was in 300 level. It should be 2002. So when I got home for my 400 level IT, my unquenchable desire was to become a computer literate. I just had to lay my hand on the computer. And after that, I learned my first card program from learning my first card program that's AutoCAD. I just, and it has really changed my life. Um, so I want to thank the leadership of IESA. I want to thank the leadership of the department. This has always been eminent. So I have not taken this presentation lightly because somebody might just receive a spark that would set them on a upward trajectory. So what do I do? So this talk has um, simple sections. We have, what do I do? The role of industrial engineering in what I do, um, challenges and prospects for industrial engineering in the nation and indeed in the world, um, I then the engineer in a digital world, then we can talk about the questions and the answer. So what I do, I'm a fabricator, I'm a card modeler, a designer, or you know, what's the, um, in professional terms, they call it detail designer. I'm a manufacturer, I deploy digital manufacturing, and I'm a consultant. So, in all of these, um, I have 3D modeling as a core, as a, as a foundational skill. There's almost nothing I do. The house I live in, everywhere. The table, the table you are looking at, almost everything I do has been modeled, usually as a 3D model. But once in a while, if the case is very simple, you do a 3D design and you move. But 
uh, because of several uh, complexities, several things that industry needs, um, I always advise you try to model. Um, so how did I start modeling? Industrial engineering taught me that we should model. And we have several types of model which I have come across over time. So, and of course, my official designation is as a detail engineer. So who is a detail engineer? The detail engineer is responsible for in-depth project information, um, project data, project specification, anything that is required for the project by several parties. The detail engineer is responsible for developing the model, making it available, and addressing stakeholders with exactly what they need, not um, leaving them to start going through things that are not relevant for their situation. So it develops suitable models for the project. It's often a 3D model, and there are several softwares. I particularly use about nine softwares with different levels of, that's nine card softwares with different levels of competence and complexity. But over time, you discover that a single tool does not answer um, a specific problem. So you want to acquire more and more. So, but it's usually 3D model, but there are other types of model. Yeah, you generate discipline specific drawings. So um, assembly plans, shipping plans. So for most projects, like the ones I have handled, you are moving from one location to another. You have multiple dependencies. You have um, multiple modules, multiple dependencies, multiple, different levels of requirement. There are materials you want to move, it has to be encased. There are materials you want to move, you can ship loose. All those things are, need to be captured at a very early stage in the project to minimize complications. Um, if you, there is a, there's a airport, I think the Berlin International Airport, that project failed because they did not capture detailed engineering. All the engineers worked, everybody worked, but there was nobody aggregating all the information. And by the time they were building their electrical cables, they were having disjoints and that project failed. Germany. So after those things, some of the lesson learned is to concretize um, design as a full discipline so that there will be less problems. As we know, the devil is in the details. And if you don't master the details of your project, you are going to run into problems. So let me also clarify this. Um, every discipline has its details. Every engineer is supposed to know all the details. But how do you know if the thickness of your cable covering is 3 mm instead of 1 mm? You design the cable, you know the thickness. But what is the thickness of the cover? What is the gross weight of the cable? You know, it's very tiny details. But by the time you keep adding a million tiny items, you are going to end up with a ton of crisis. So th that is what the detail engineer does. It makes sure that all details align. Um, it meets specifications. So like in my industry, you have um, safety in design. Um, how do you design a facility so that it does not fail? You have industry specifications, you have ISO, you have OSHA, you have ACME, ACME, ASME, that's ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers. You have all sorts of code. So how do you make sure that this design meets those codes? Um, you know, just like laws, when you have codes, you also have clauses. So many engineers, they know the codes, they, but some of the clauses are conflicting. So the digital engineer needs to take these clauses and say, oh, my elevations are clashing, or I have this and this issue. And he needs to do that on a timely basis before the project um, is compromised on that basis. So he develops the MTO, he develops, he compiles data sheets, and provides them for, usually it's a uh, document controller. It prepares the inputs that will be needed for operating manual. So every time you buy a product, there's a manual for that product. Um, it's a digital engineer that knows the nitty gritty. He knows where you shouldn't put a nail. He knows the minor details of that job. And he prepares those materials so that by the time the people who are compiling the manual, um, for instance, even a, a vessel, a big project like a, a ship has what we call an operating manual. That is his duty to prepare that manner so that by the time that phase of the project starts, um, there will be adequate information. So he prepares phasing for the project, 
what are we going to do first? What model we start before the other? How do we how do we do fabrication? How do we assemble? How do we shape? You know, those sequencing uh, is more easily done when you have proper detail engineering data. It aggregates um, project data for data driven execution. So one of the secrets of the uh, Western world and even all over, except in our crime, is they, are, they drive decisions, management decisions with data. You don't just um, make up your mind to say, um, you know, you, you cannot run engineering with a term rule. That's the truth. So you take data and say, how has this project been? How has, what is the performance? What is the, what is the weight? What is the, what is the loading? Or you want to design a house and you design a house for a hundred people. Meanwhile, the final occupants will be 10. What you have done is, if you are not careful, the house will cost maybe five times more because you are going to deploy more stringent code that is needed. So, but it's a digital engineer that will say, oh, what is the occupancy level? There is a global data, there is a local data. It needs to aggregate this data and present it in a way the engineers would understand and they can use it. So it also extracts information for the project, um, different levels of information. It provides support for project management, cost control and other stakeholders. He develops graphics, or he or she develops graphics for marketing, management, and presentation. So at different stages in the project, we have, we have what we call model review, where you want to see where are we on this job. So at that point, um, usually the, the project owner is on ground, and they want to see exactly where we are, not, um, not a, a description, not a document we, can't, we cannot interpret. Give me the physical status of my project. Where are we today? The detail engineer develops that. He, he runs, he updates his model to that status. And there are different levels of modeling and it needs to um, provide so, so sufficient um, information as at when needed. So then the role of IE in what I do. I is, is essentially engineering management. When I started my career, I kept telling my managers, I said, I have a degree in engineering management. And that's the truth. Um, it, and it allows me to see the point of view of my managers. Um, it's so easy for people to get discipline specific, but when you have done something like industrial engineering, you have done um, psychology, a little of psychology here, a little of accounting in our days. I don't know if it still happens. We did a little accounting. We went, you know, we were just going around picking this bits and of everything. It was, I like to akin it to the training of a king. When you are training a king, you, you, you teach him across the whole breadth of the kingdom so that there's no aspect that he doesn't understand. That's the essence of industrial engineering training. So all those heavy um, course units that we used to do has that benefit that we have a very broad spectrum. And when the accountant is talking, we understand it. We are not understanding it from our salary view. We're understanding it from the need of the business. And so I am forever grateful for that. Then we have, I remember the presentation um, Dr. Charles Owaba did for us. Then he said we should write, um, do a little research on Frank and Lillian Gilbert. So I went in and I did that study. In fact, I typed it myself. It was it's, I still have it till today. And the lesson I learned from that presentation was there is always a better way. There's always a better way. There's always a better way to do my job. In fact, personally, my target is, um, let's say, okay, at work, I don't intend to work for more than four hours in a day. And the rest is just to understand my environment and do other things. So. But what does that involve? That means I must be able to achieve what people do in eight, 10 hours. I must be able to achieve it in three, four hours. So, but you can only get to that point by focusing on what is the better way to do what I do. And to deploy that, the Japanese call it Kaizen. Uh, it means continuous improvement. Um, I just want to get better. What is the best software for the job I am doing? What is the best workflow? You know, you have the tools and you have the workflow. The workflow is specifically the, the set of all the toolkits. Uh, so it's a set of tools that you deploy. 
Sometimes you want to pull data from a CAD software, you put it, pull it into a spreadsheet. When you are done with the spreadsheet, you put some in a presentation, move some back to the CAD software. I had to learn that um, very, it's not a, so at that point, it's not a open house. Not many people know how to manage um, um, resources and tools up in depth like that, but I just had to learn it. And so because of that, you develop a, a network. A lot of people tend to know you as a solution provider because you've dug to the very depth. You are literally the best on it. I remember every time they are looking for, every time there's a problem, experienced managers will ask, who is the best person for this job? And if you have gotten to that point, you often be pointed as. So I helped me to develop this and focus on the best workflow for my job. And it's been a fantastic career, really. Now, so then the other part of I talks about productivity, efficiency, effectiveness. Efficiency is different from effectiveness. You know, by clarifying these things, you, you know what is important. You know that your company is not existing to your company is not existing to, to provide jobs. That's that's meaningless to them. Um, I even recently I started telling my people, I say every person that employs you has taken a risk. There's a risk that you will not perform. There's a risk that you will be a problem and you'll be a demotivating member of the team. There's always a risk with every business activity. So, and above all, if the company does not make more than they are giving you, the company is going to run a loss. And we've seen cases like that when companies employ um, um, uh, staff, sometimes expatriates who are more expensive than what they can handle. And they give the prob company's problem. So you are in a business, you are at work specifically to solve the problem of the company, to make more money for the company, to allow the company to develop enough room to grow. So any staff that is doing that is a valuable staff. I remember my first job, um, by my fifth month, my boss was letting um, relatives go. That's his brother-in-law, um, even, you know, he had relatives, people from his town, but he had to let them go and he didn't let me go. And I was like, you know, I can't ask that question, but I wondered, why are you keeping me? But he now, down the line, he explained anyway, and it's a skill set. I could do, I could solve like five problems. I was making presentation. I was doing research for him. I was, you know, I was solving more problems than what those guys, those guys took their job and sat on it and they were doing their job well. But the other skill sets, they didn't have so much. So when there's problem, the skill sets determine um, who is going and who is not going. So I let me do this. Then the other one is work breakdown. You are doing work breakdown in facility design. You are doing work breakdown in work system design. You are doing work breakdown in project management. So work breakdown as is, it became a habit. And in engineering projects and new projects, what you will always find is there's always something you have not done before. A new product you have not handled. A new material. Okay, like I have a friend. He, he was in oil and gas. And somebody came to him and said, I want to build a palm oil refinery. The only refinery they had was in Malaysia and they, they don't allow foreigners coming there. So this fellow wants a oil refinery and it's definitely different from a crude refinery. So how are you going to do that? So you will always encounter um, things you have never seen before, but your ability to break that work to the elements, you now do the first milestone, you build it up back until you have a complete project, especially when you have good skills with risk. So in all that you are identifying your risk, it, it makes you unbeatable in the workplace and you have a free sale and it's, you, you, you just, you, you're going to enjoy your career because when your boss likes you, it's easy to get a lot of things done. It's easy to take a break. It's easy to go, you know, it's, it's just, that's just the way it is. You, you enjoy work. It won't be a burden to you. Then the other part is unconstrained optimization. So, you know, we have Citeris, Paribas, all things being equal. That's a lie. It's never equal. It can never be equal. You can't be equal to your boss or his brother or his wife. There's nothing that is equal. So you are, as an industrial engineer, you are looking for the solution that is best 
for the situation. And when you know that it is just for that situation, another problem is going to come tomorrow. So when you are a perpetual solution maker, you know, the management knows where, everybody knows where their, their bread is buttered. So you are on it, you, are, you have a tool, you have resources. Like I, when, when we did those classes on heuristics, I was very fascinated because um, it, it just fitted into my life. So I'm always developing a tool. I have several spreadsheets for several aspects of my work. I don't, plan, I don't run calculations manually. I just find the spreadsheets, put it there, I keep it. There, I also have what we call a knowledge management system whereby um, I'm not thinking of something. I just do it. If, I, if you need something on my system, I can do it over the phone because I know exactly where what is. I'm not looking for, there's no search button or something like that. So what that does is you have to sign. So there are times when other engineers come to me and they need something. I'll just give them a spreadsheet. And some of, sometimes they even want to hide it. I, I, I just laugh. At it. But engineering thrives. Engineering cannot thrive on thumb rules. The way we, um, our chairman said something very fantastic, VUCA. VUCA is the killer of thumb rules. So if you have built your career around thumb rules, it's going to fail. Something is going to, volatility is going to come in, uncertainty is going to come in. Something is just going to upturn the table. So, but when you have tools, you can always update your tools. If you have a model, you can always update your model. You can just do a save us and you have a new model, remove what has changed. And a, a supplier calls you, I don't have this type of uh, motor. You just switch it, you put in a, a new model or make changes and the model is up to, up to size. Even things like, um, let, let me give an instance. So for people who do long lead project, large projects, you are shipping something. You are bringing in the components from Malaysia. We call it long lead items. So if that long lead item is going to have a change after you've done your design, are you going to start all over again? So what they are going to do is, oh, this is the shipping weight. They are just going to send it to you as a matter of fact, and you want to update your model because if you don't have a live um, system, a live toolkit, you are going to keep getting stranded. So that is, these are the things I've learned as an industrial engineer and they've been tremendous in my career. Um, challenges and prospects. AI is the only hope for reviving our economy. Um, with due respect, those when we were taught engineering as a nation, um, Optimization was out of the topic. Um, those who taught us engineering had all the materials in the world and all the time to do it. The case is not so again. So if you are not able to bring out the best, or if you are not able to optimize without sacrificing essential components of your business, um, you are going to close down and it keeps happening. The IE graduate is a, is a manager, is an engineering manager graduate, management graduate with deep insight into the money. Why, what do I mean by deep insight into the money? So aside of the accountant and probably the CEO in any business, how do you, who is able to sum up um, how the 100 million budget was spent? It's only the accountant that knows, and that's why everybody hates him. But the high is able to build up this cost. Once he has insufficient data, he's able to add it up. Remember, you have skills in work breakdown, so you have resource breakdown too. So you are able to add up the resources and say, uh, didn't we buy a car? Didn't we do this? Didn't we? So you can trace the figure of the organization. In fact, um, over time, I, I realized that I could tell the health of my organization. I could tell when they are going to sack people. I could tell based on the flow of transactions I'm seeing, because the transactions will happen, but if you are not looking out for them, or you are not aware of the value of those transactions. You will not know. So you, could, you can tell a lot of that, but very few disciplines prepare you for this, apart from industrial and production engineering. And we need to know that most businesses in Nigeria are set up to exploit opportunities. They are not set up based on improvement or innovation. That is not the real issue. The real issue is there is nobody you will tell or show how to make um, one million from doing a business of, let's say from, for a business of five million, you, you show him how he can save two million so that he has a profit of three million. There's nobody that will not listen to you. 
So regardless of where the company is, how the business is set up, you can make a difference by being the solution provider, by having the tools and resources to make sure that there is always money. And I've had the um, um, gracious opportunity to experience that. I've been on projects where my the client is the one coming to tell my company to say, this guy is not earning what he should be earning. They don't know my salary, but they just think that I should be paid more. So it, imagine in a year, you are getting salary increase without discussing with your manager, like three, four times within a year. The simple reason is, once the client is seen, actually it was a foreign project, foreign clients, but once they are seeing your intervention, the value you are adding, they know this problem you solved is going to save us $100,000 or something. They, they are going to take you serious. And we, we need to understand that, that nobody can turn aside, no business can turn aside from somebody that is saving them money. But the judging nature of our businesses ensure that they are always entrenched in stress politics, cabal, you know, we have all of that. We should focus less on that and focus on being the best. When you are the best, it's hard. And even when you have outgrown a particular company, it's easy for you to switch nature. Um, I have friends who tend to call me that because I've worked in about, in my career, maybe seven companies. And it's not, it's not intentional, but for whatever reason, um, I just have to move or I've grown beyond. Sometimes they just demand my service and they are ready to do whatever it takes to, to get it. Who am I? I was made to work. So um, we need to understand that too. So limited career opportunities. Um, we need to start somewhere. Um, this is Nigeria. This is Africa. They are, these problems are not peculiar to us. But when you start somewhere and you inject your industrial engineering skills. So some people are starting in software design. Some people are starting in quality engineering. There are several places to start, but these skills will not go. These skills will not go away if you, if you don't allow them to go. You just impute them and you start seeing the difference. I know an IE that worked in banking and he, he still has a fantastic career because the money is the thing. Once you can solve problems using these tools, you, you will have a leverage. So when we talk about graduate unemployability, uh, well, I've heard this a lot, and to a large extent, it is true. Um, I would even say I've seen a graduate that could not use a caliper, a veneer caliper, and I'm like, this is a sin. Um, but that's what it is. The only way to get around that is to stop depending on just the university. The knowledge is so universal these days that if you don't know, it's easy, it's laziness to blame um, our universities, to blame ASU, to blame people. And I'm not saying laziness derogatorily. I'm saying we could do better than playing the BAME game. So every time in my days, where every time ASU is on strike, I just go and learn a trade. I go and learn a trade. I, I, I did like four trades. I know how to rewind the coil. I learned welding. I learned fabrication. I learned so many things. So once ASU is on strike, I don't even care because no matter how long they spend, I'm adding value. So if you do that, um, we need to avoid that trap of earning money. Yes, yeah, we need money, but what I did then is to set aside my need and focus on learning. Because when you stay long enough in the place where you want to learn, you have value. And at a point, that value will pay off. I'll close this with, okay, the same thing ties into low wage. Get a side business, something you can do to balance the situation temporarily until you have skills. I remember my first um, engineering job when I was applying to that company and the human resource manager was just, he just said, he didn't, let me just assume he didn't like my face. So I passed the interview and he said, no that they did not follow procedure, so it was not going to take me. Um, and I was still working in consulting then. So what I did is I just kept pushing. Four years down the line, they saw my CV and they were like, oh, we want your services. And I told them how much they would need to pay. Then they were going to pay me something very, uh, they were going to pay me 80,000. When I was giving them something four or five times that rate, 
at that point, they were like, ah, we can't pay. And I was, I told them, it's not possible. It's not, it just won't work because I, I earn X, Y, Z. So how would you bring me into your, how would I leave my, my company that is enjoying my services for you when you are not going to pay more? So, but the only reason I could make that stake or make that demand was because I had added skills and I was already enjoying my employer. So why would, if you are taking me away from here, you will need to pay this. And they, they, in fact, at a point, they, they, I had a conversation with them and they were like, I'll give you an offer you can't refuse. And we, are, we got to that point, but it took, it took competence to get there. And without it, nobody's going to look at where you are coming from or what your problem is. So the only way you can overcome the knowledge gap is to all, one of the ways you can also spend money, but if you don't direct your expenses in the right pathway, probably then we also need to look at it and say, we need a unique skill set, a unique skill set, not just knowledge. Knowledge is abundant. It's actually we, in a, we are in a generation with excess knowledge, but what do you bring to the table? What knowledge? that you have can make a difference. That is what we are what we are talking about. So how do we make IE a staple in Nigeria? How do we proliferate industrial engineering? Um, we can use IE to develop careers in technical niches and there are several technical niches. So one, uh, let, let me go back there. So part of the reason why you need to have a practical feel of this engineering, at least you need to be able to make a table. Let me just simplify it that way. Or maybe make a chair or something. You need to be able to do something tangible, something physical. There is a learning that goes with it that um, Workshop 101 will not teach you. For instance, what is the size of material? How much material do you need to buy to make a table? You know, there's a flow of information. If you go for workshop practice, all the materials you will use will be provided. You will not know where it is made. You will not know the quantity. You will not know the cost. You will not know so many um, important variables that would affect your career down the line. But if, for instance, you know how to do an Arduino kit, you know that that kit is coming from China, you know, you know there are so many things you learn by just getting practical. So when you now get to the field, you'll be able to tweak your career in the direction that is more comfortable for you. Um, in my search, I've seen industrial engineer work as cost engineers. The uh, cost engineers are always in demand because how much is, how much is your company going to charge? Um, even if you are an entrepreneur, how much are you going to charge for the job at hand? You just have to know it. You can't gloss it. If you gloss it, you will end up in debt. You will pay for what you have not spent. So industrial engineers are valuable in project management. Um, project management, even when the project is on hold, it's, on, it's suspended, you still have to keep the project manager. You can't tell him to go. And if you tell him to go, you need to be careful about the handover. Otherwise, the project will be in jeopardy. So there are, they, these are um, careers that are very, very strategic in engineering almost all over. We have detailed engineering, engineers, Digital engineers generally, they, sorry, I had a call. Digital engineers are those who are responsible for all that I have said, and that is what I do. Um, it has always been in demand. Um, we have quality engineering. There are different types of quality engineering. We have, the, we have the soft quality. We have the hard quality, material engineering. There are different um, branches, and it's just you that need to combine your talent, your experience and career to, to get one. There are still several. We have subsea engineering. I know one of our classmates. These are things I've seen my um, well, people in industrial engineering do. I have one of our classmates is a subsea engineer in the UK and he, he did very well. By the time he, he was heading a project for a major subsea company and several cases like that. So one thing I would like to warn is don't be promoted beyond your technical competence. So we have technical competence and there are people, so the motivation for, especially in smaller companies, the motivation to push you up once management likes you uh, is very high. 
but you need to sustain your career or your career at the higher level with a very in-depth learning. So otherwise, you'll be making mistakes. You'll be running on assumptions. And by the way, um, the, I would like to tell us, the level of assumptions in professional practice is extremely high um, because people don't leverage tools. And if you don't have tools, then you cannot, use, you cannot drive your decision with data. So you use a code. Um, for instance, let me not go into details, but you use a code, you use an assumption, you use a summary, or you let's say you use an heuristic, a heuristic to, to arrive at the answer. So this is not, that is why, so at the end of it, there are so many errors embedded in your project. So you need to be the good guy that keeps the project from failing and at that point, it's nice. So, um, so as part of calibrating our career, let's, I just want to throw up some global facts, some important things we need to note. You are not in a race with your fellow engineers, your fellow graduates. You are in a race with the whole world. China um, graduates 600,000 engineers in a year. India, 1.2 million. So what are you going to do to stand out? Um, I think this week, uh, day before yesterday, I saw a picture of yam imported into Nigeria. Yes, it will be imported because they have gone beyond basic agriculture and engineering is, is percolating every aspect of their, of their society. Because there are just too many engineers that you can't you can't fit them into a single trade or a single discipline. So everybody just goes out to, to do something. And so that's those are the people you are competing with. We have not counted the German engineers, we have not counted the British, the American, and everybody. So these are the people you are competing with. So your skill set and not your certificate are your bargaining chips. They are the things you bring to the table. And it's not just one skill. You need to have it a toolkit. Like I, I like to point to my IE toolkit. I still have a lot of them. And so one of the things I also did back then is to start to convert some of these tools, like convert tools into how do I call them? Into more agile tools. Like you do an optimization, you convert it into a, a practical software, something in Excel. Sometimes you write a short program. I did one or two of that, and they are extremely useful. But I did them for my discipline, and they, they are extremely useful even till now. So I know several engineers who don't have degrees, and they are they had a good career. They got their degree after all the fact they they started with literally O level, and they were already executing projects before they could graduate in university. So it's a skill you bring to the table when the project is in under pressure. Nobody cares whether you have a degree or not, or whether you have a PhD or not. What people want is solve my problem. And if you can solve that problem, you can understand that calculation, um, they'll pay you. And the global trend is to give your job to robots. So what are you going to do to fight robots? Elon Musk has started his, his robotic. He was saying AI was bad and all, but he's now a key AI player. And that's the person that is taking the job you are hoping to get in Tesla. So I like to address the issue of traveling abroad too. For those of us that are planning to travel abroad, especially the younger generation, are you going to travel and wash toilets? Are you going to travel and do many jobs or maybe Uber or something, or even in Nigeria? So is the skill you bring to the table that will determine where you are, where you are placed. There are restrictions, yes, there are rules and all that. But I have seen people make uh, very high figures outside of um, the regulations because once you can solve these specific problems, and please let's note it is complete solutions. So it's not just a partial solution, but can you fix my problem? Can you take away my headache? I'll pay you. That's literally the attitude I've seen. So follow the money. And when we say follow the money, um, what will need money in 20 years time? Whatever situation you have now, rich, poor, or whatever, the truth is it is what you will need in 20 years. So let's say you are 50 years now. In 20 years, you'll be, you'll be needing a, at a particular range of income and that should guide your activity. So if you are, if you are 20 years now, 
in 10 years' time, whether you like it or not, you want to get married, um, that's the money. That's the money you will need. So it's not money for data. That is your priority now, money to take your girlfriend out and have a nice time. You need money to set up a family. You need money to buy a car, get a rent and all. So it's, that's the money you are looking at. And when you look at that, it will dictate what you need to do now because your finance today is a product of where you are coming from yesterday. So your finance in 20 years is a product of what you do now. So um, IT is not the money and it's not website development. And many of the tools, you know, I've seen several careers, several short-term solutions. They are not the money. It's the money of the future that you need to start learning how to hand now. So that by the time you get into the future, you'll be a top earner. Um, so find a way to infuse your talents. That's the only way you get a unique. So yeah, um, I think we take the analogy of the footprint. I'm sorry, your fingerprint. So you have a set of skills that very few people have. If you had your training as an industrial engineer to that skill, it makes life easy because there will be very few people that can come up with exactly that skill set. Like when I'm at work, my boss called me one day and he was like, I like your attitude. You, you, don't, you don't throw tantrums when we do take managerial decisions. And I said, thank you, sir. But the underpinning knowledge there is that I know that in any organization I work, there are very few people that can bring the skills I have to the table. So that means my skills are irreplaceable. And as long as I have that, even if you tell me to go, I'll get another job. And it has always been like that. If I'm at, if I've, I've, I've had to let go maybe three times, and every time I get the next job, it's better. Of course, I'm a Christian. I have faith and all that you pray. But every time I'm getting the next job, it is better. And usually by order of magnitude, it's not just um, add 20,000 salary. It's always much better. So that's about that. So the winners in the emerging world are going to use the computer and their skill set. So get to the peak of your career. The currency is the delivery of complete solution. Like I said, complete solution. You're not bringing partial. Um, a software is a partial solution because you, you need to interpret it for all to understand. So you need to learn to speak in languages that people understand. Programming is not a peak. Millions of programmers exist. Um, I, when I did my master's, uh, when I started my master's, um, Professor Lulayet taught me this one. I hired a programmer and I was trying to you know, teach him how to do this and do that. And we spent months, we, we spent more than eight months on it. Fantastic programmer, earning um, millions as a very high, highly paid programmer, but he could not solve my problem. So it's not just about program. It's not just about partial solution. Even design that I do is not just the peak. You, if you design, you need to be able to implement your design. And for you to implement it, you have to be able to do it. So, and it impacts. So when I tell people, I say, my fabrication business is my crucible because I practice what I want to do in my consulting career. Personally, I have my crucible. I have tried it. I know it will work. I can approach you with confidence because I have tried it. I'm not telling you theory and we just need to do that. So also we want to learn to build uh, mathematical models or CAD models. It's so easy. Yeah, there are so many simple ones like um, I've, I've trained eight years. I have eight years old who are able to model a whole CAD. I've seen eight years, seven year old children who have been trained to model, you know, complex things. and it's just, it's easy. It's, it's the language of the future. So, of course, it's not compulsory, but it's an advice. Then build your software toolkit. There are so many out. Let me give you the case of Onshape. Um, what's your name? Onshape. Yeah, Onshape. So, Onshape is an online modeling software. And over time, you discover that um, it was free initially, but down the line, it was not free. When they said it was not free, I couldn't, um, um, I, I would not be at liberty to change Naira into dollar to pay for a software. I just let it go. But I had other tools. What am I trying to say? There are tools, some of them are free, some of them are paid for, and you have options. But if you don't build your, your strengths, you become dependent 
on a single software and essentially you'll be running into cash flow issues. So then multi heuristics and algorithm optimizations are not possible. So the winners of the future are not going to use a single algorithm. In fact, uh, at what, from what I know, even artificial intelligence has its own weaknesses. So we have multiple heuristics. So imagine you run four heuristics to arrive at your optima. Who is going to beat that for that situation? So you are always coming up with the best solution for the set of constraints you have. And if you don't execute, your invention is just an idea. Um, execution is key and you just have to do it. Finally, I would want to talk about um, your industrial network. So um, I'll give the story of a man, he, he retired this, um, this July and everybody was, uh, their hands on their, on their head, that how are they going to survive? His name is called Ralph Gabrowinski. So I met him online, um, he, he publishes a, a blog. And by just um, connecting to Ralph, Every new software in the last eight years, every new card software, I know when they come out, I get a better copy. As in, I, I'm able to subscribe to their better version. I get news, I get updates just by following Ralph because he is a leader in um, computer design journalism. And because of that, everybody, once they release their software, they are always telling Ralph, they are always asking him for more, you know? And by doing that, he just led the whole industry and he did well. So now that he's retiring, we're all asking ourselves, how do we stay on top? Because he was such a fantastic resource. So what, is, what does that say? You need your own resource. I have friends, okay, okay. One of my friends, my friend and partner, he just became the lead designer in this company. He's going to France for training um, within the next couple of months. And he was asking me, oh, how do I solve this problem? Management is asking me to find a, like a, a template for planning their project so that they can know how long it takes to execute a particular job. And he, he had to ask me and I gave him the resources I have. So you need your network, people you can run to, but they need to also be on the global scene, global, global players that give you enough breadth to do what you want to do. And I think that way uh, it becomes easier from that point. So by and large, um, the, the last thing I would like to point is um, what I would call concerning staying at the peak of your career. For every career, there is a trend, there is a peak. Like in my career, we now have algorithmic modeling, we have algorithmic engineering. So rather than modeling, let's, let's say you need a table, rather than making a table and, se and sending it to the workshop, you now make a table that you can change the size dynamically. Because the next customer, remember we are in the days of mass customization. What that implies is that the next person is going to ask for the same table where he needs half of the size. Are you going to start all over again? So you need a dynamic model. And we are, that is where algorithmic modeling comes in. That's, so we do that. I, I have to just learn that call. Now, after that, we have algorithmic engineering. So imagine you want to design a cooling system. And your cooling system, you want it to be efficient and carbon free and all these um, noise they make about climate change. Or maybe your your imagine you want to build a house and they are saying your house needs to meet leads um lead specification. How do you do that? You have to start running software. So that's where algorithmic engineering comes from. You can model the heat it's generated in the house. You can estimate the weight. For instance, there is a question I ask my team. I say on a facility. Let okay. Let me use a house. What is the weight of what is the weight that the painting we had to your house? You, you understand as in your a house is painted. What is the weight of painting added to the building? So what people do is estimate, but you have enough data already to, to come to a 90% value for the painting. 
So, you, but you will not be able to extract this if you are not driving the boundaries. And I keep telling people, most softwares you buy, people are using less than 50% of the capability, including your, your truly Microsoft Word. So we need to dig deeper, get more value from the money you have. You've paid for the software, but you're not using it. It's your loss. So we need to dig deeper, get more value from our activities, and get more bands for the book. Thank you very much. I feel honored for this presentation. Wow. All right. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Engineer Latun, um, or Latunde Peter Abe for, for the presentation. That's a whole lot for us to chew. Uh, before we start the Q and A session, I will, you could remember for those uh, that were with us at the beginning, the chairman, engineer Femi Akitunde, uh, supposed to make comment right now. Um, but since um, it's not available, Mrs. Um, Mrs. Wale Odufalu will be doing that for us. She will make some few comments before we ask uh, engineer Abe some few questions. I, I, I just, I, I don't know how to introduce her, so I made a PowerPoint presentation for her. So, Mrs. Uh, Wale Udufalu, can you take the stage, please? All right, thank you very, very much. I want to appreciate um, the organizers, Aesa, and um, the esteemed chairman for giving me this opportunity. And I want to thank the VC and um, the, prof the uh, professor, Himself, when we spoke earlier, I was really, really inspired about the opportunity to be here. You know, as they say, success has many friends. So I'm officially a, <laughs> a family member of IESA. In many ways, my dad is an alumnus of the University of Ibado. He graduated 1967 as a geologist. My husband is an engineer. And I have colleagues in uh, from industrial engineering, which you mentioned earlier, our group MD, who is the chairman of this um, association, engineer Femi Akintunde himself. You mentioned Josephine Femi, and I must say they've been very good ambassadors of the profession. So I want to just say thank you once again. And I want to thank our esteemed speaker, engineer Latunde, uh, Peter Abbey, I've learned so much, and I'm sure that we all have. I'll just use the opportunity to just highlight a few things. Particularly, you know, he mentioned severally um, the company, the employer. And I must say that, you know, sitting um, on the side of executive management, one of the things that we have seen, and I dare say that sometimes when you sit across the interview table and uh, you see the CV and it reads industrial engineering, you see everybody sitting up because already you perceive that there's going to be a strong value from this candidate because of the experience we have had with um, candidates with this background. So. Really, the things that our esteemed speaker spoke about um, are things that are being experienced, and Alpha Mid is one of those places that we can testify to the value and the impact of industrial engineering. I would just like to um, skip, touch on two or three things which he mentioned. Like I said, I think they're very high value points that are worth uh, reiterating. Um, First of all, I think the, the fact that he took us back to where our esteemed chairman started from on linking the fact that all things are never equal. And um, from an entrepreneur's point of view, you find that that's the illusion that many people start their career with. It's almost as though from day one, you can just draw a straight line and keep moving. But the point is that things change. The environment is... Um, it's, it's never the same as what it starts out to be. And our chairman did define that for us. In fact, with the two vocas, you can almost align the situational challenges with the solutions that should come from them. And where you have the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, the things that um, engineer Peter Abe spoke to 
again, align with what the chairman shared with us earlier about having a clear vision for your career, understanding the environment. And he spoke about, you know, getting to the peak of your sector. And you can't get to the peak of your sector if you don't understand the sector, if you don't, um, if you can't relate with what is going on. The infamous uh, book, Who Moved My Cheese, I think is a clear example of how as um, industrial engineers moving into detail engineering or ev any other aspect, which he also did share with us, shows how we can't afford to remain comfortable, assuming that everything will remain the same. Um, I like the fact that he reiterated to us the benefit of industrial engineering, um, the training of a king, and I think that's very apt in terms of breadth, the depth, and um, the being solution oriented. In other words, what's the better way to do what I do? Another key thing from this presentation that you know really drove home is avoiding the trap of chasing money. I dare say from a professional point of view, um, you find that a lot of people who start the journey the same day, but have different focus. One whose focus is on money, the other whose focus is on knowledge and upskilling, upgrading themselves. You can literally predict um, where the two will end up. And the truth is that the story is always different for those who give themselves to becoming master craftsmen in their profession. And that's what our esteemed speaker has highlighted to us. Um, like he said, without implementation, your invention remains an idea. It remains a theory. And no employer wants to pray, play, pay for those who are theoretical. No employer wants to pay for people who are just about um, construing um, ideal situations. We want people who solve problems and it's very endearing to hear this, you know, being reiterated in this, um, um, the, 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 the topic that has been shared. Then the last thing is thinking long-term. And that's a key point of learning for all of us in terms of being able to project your future dreams and needs and draw the roadmap from where you are now to where you need to be and following those steps. And of course, he mentioned several things in relation to how we do that as um, industrial engineers, as detail engineers. And, you know, for me, uh, by the time I get to the office on Tuesday, there are certain things I'm going to sit with my engineering colleagues and say, okay, now I know some... <laughs> Some more areas in which we can discuss. I, I was particularly intrigued about the example of the Berlin airport where a project failed because it, uh, attention wasn't paid to detail engineering. So I just use the opportunity once again to thank our esteemed speaker and um, Yes, one last thing, I'm sorry. You know, he spoke about the industrial network and that again gives uh, ties back to what the esteemed vice chancellor, Professor Keo Adibowale shared with us about the need for us to engage in the alumni community, take advantage of building this network so that we can make, you know, the alma mater a better place. Truly, you know, like they say, the, you ride on the shoulders of giants to get where you are going. And that's something that we can all take. I believe that this platform will continue to afford us such opportunities. I know that even though I do not carry an industrial engineering certificate, you will not uh, deny me and uh, the opportunity of attending this meeting. And it's something that I really would recommend to everyone. So I, I, I can see a lot of potential. If this is the maiden edition and we're starting off on this high note, I believe there's so much more that can be gained. And congratulations once again. Thank you once again to a highly esteemed speaker and to everyone. Um, also to comment the level of participation. We started at, I think, 58, at some point, 97, you know, 107, and it's been sustained. Thank you so much, um, esteemed uh, engineer uh, Olabi Peters, for holding our, our attention through and through. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you, Mrs. Wally. I would recommend that we check our, our LinkedIn profile and read some of our articles, please. Um, just do that for, uh, for the whole house. Uh, right now, I want all of us to kindly unmute and let's just give you a round of applause to our lecturer. Please, at least for now, please, just unmute. Yeah.
for him. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So it's a question and answer session. Thank you so, so much, sir. So we could, I could see Thank some you. hands. Yeah, some. Uh, you. Uh, all right. Uh, we can send the, the questions to the chat. Are sure you put key? Please, Engineer Mui Watijani, please, can you ask your question? Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, a very lovely evening to my esteemed colleagues, engineers in the house, our senior. Thank you. And uh, my junior ones. My name is Engineer Mui Watijani. Let me start by thanking um, Engineer Olapita Abe. He's a fantastic guy while we were in school, a year ahead of me. I'm 2005 mm -hmm. set, the class rep. Uh, before I move on, let me thank Madam Wale Udufalu, my mentor, mm -hmm. because I work under her tutelage while in Alpha Mid. When she's talking about industrial engineering, she's like, born and bred in industrial engineering because she has gone all through our processes. So she knows, as she sees now, she's sitting there as the MD of our family development company. So she knows much about this thing I've been talking about. So don't let her, don't let her, so we can even invite her as an honorary member of, honorary alumnus of uh, industrial engineering. engineering. So let's just put that one aside. So I want to thank Abe once again for what he has done. I'm the CEO of Philo Material Services Limited. Um, while we were in school, my own is just in the form of comments, not um, um, question per se. Let me just buttress what I'll be asking. While we were in school then, I remember what the built in us is confidence, which I believe what has been our watchword all along. Because I remember when we were in school, there is this kind of dichotomy that we are an industrial engineer, you are a factory worker. While some of our colleagues are there talking about they want to work in Nestle, Nestle, Nestle. Engineer family actually came from one of our ESA um, dinner then. And the admonishment, he gave us some kind of admonish um, talk, admonishing talk that we should be focused, which of one of the things Abe was talking about. Um, then I believe so much that I'm not going to work in the industry, in the, in, in, in the industrial sector. Let me go into service line. We have what, is what has been guiding us to date. So I just want to encourage some of our junior ones to ensure that what our lecturers are building into us per se is this confidence that wherever we are going, we should be able to be an ambassador of industrial engineer wherever we are going into. So we should not have it at the back of our mind that because somebody is in, uh, is in mechanical, or is in electrical, or is in petroleum. I know I have trained mechanical, I have trained industrial, I have trained civil work. I'm a civil engineer today and they are excelling in some of their various fields. So I just want to okay. find the organizer of this and we'll be willing to have more of this. Thank you very much once again. That is my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Um, Thank and, you. Uh, anyway. Questions, please. Do we have questions? Um, please, we just need to ask questions. All right. Anyway, let me ask uh, Engineer uh, Abi. Uh, my question is, um, I read through your profile. I checked through even the presentation as, uh, as you're going now. But I wanted to ask you, where was the turning point in all this in your career? Where was the turning point? I, I could see you, uh, you, you are a detailed person, but where was the turning point? You know, in all like 15, 20 years, so where, can you just tell us before the detail engineering in fact, I went online to check detail engineering and I know it cut across building services, project management, what have you, which you have mentioned, but where was the turning point, please? Um, the turning point actually happened, okay, I happened to be lucky. I was, my father is a draftsman. So I, I started design. About, we had like a drum full of design drawings. He worked in several companies, even in building services. So, um, the career was already in line for me. I, I had A1 in technical drawing. It was good. But the turning point was Professor Bamiro's presentation. 
when he told us all those things he did with computers, you know, they were doing cost optimization, they were doing project planning. You know, they had several modules. Um, that was his work in Q. It was an ISR presentation. So when I saw that, I was like, so I can use computer to leverage so many things. I can use it to break boundaries. So once I saw that, and things were very tight in my family at that point, things were really, really bad. But once I heard that presentation, I said, I must get myself a desktop. So when I, when I got home for, that was in 300 level, but by the time I got home, I said, I wanted to buy a computer. Everybody was, what, what do you mean? What, how do you want to sustain it? But I made sure I got that desktop. And from there, I learned my first software, which was AutoCAD. I learned AutoCAD um, just after graduation and all that. So once I got the tools that was needed, okay, then another turning point, the second inflection point was when I did my first year as, an, as a business process consultant. So I wanted to be an engineer, but I was working as a consultant. And so I started going online. I started doing research. I started looking for tools. I had my first patent at that point. I wanted to apply for my patent. So I needed tools to justify and build my case and all that. So I started digging deeper into the net, into getting resources, getting tools. Because a, a, trait, a skills man is as good as his tools. So by the time I got to that point, I learned how the internet works. For instance, how does Google work? Um, the, the simple rule for how Google works is just keep digging. If you keep searching for the same thing for two weeks, Google is going, going to start directing those things your way on its own. The algorithm will learn that this computer is asking for shoes and it's going to just start sending it your way. And that's how most of them work. So those two things really changed my life and I'm where I am today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's and nice. I, Any questions, please? Okay. All right. You have something to say? No, no, no. No, sir. That's it. All right. Okay. Yeah. Questions or I should start calling names. I, I want to also appreciate and Isaac Olani Um, from the Royal Air Force. Thank you so much. I, I know you might not know me, but I know you, sir. Thank you for all the support to the Department of Industrial and Production Engineering. We want to say thank you again. And um, questions from the audience or I, I, I know people by name a lot, by name a lot, so I can start calling names. So can Emmanuel ask a question? Uh, that's my project student. Emmanuel, okay, can you ask a question? We can't, we can't have this and questions not coming. There are several people I can call here, at least I, I know several people by name. And it's even compulsory for him to be here. So that's even putting you on spot. Okay, I'm waiting for you. Okay, I'm waiting for you to ask question. If okay is not asking, um, um, uh, are you there? I think you are here. Okay, okay, all right. Ezekiel can do that. You you can't unmute. I think, okay, uh, I think Ezekiel. Okay, I can. All right, now. okay, all right, okay. Thank you. All right. Good yeah, evening, you can ask everyone. your question. Good evening. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. My my question is is this way. Um, for okay, I am more into engineering management, and just like you said, I'm a project student. So talking about project um, management across an industrial engineering now, you get to you, go, you get to the work environment as somebody who's just starting your career, career. And there are a lot of things that you, you've learned in, in, in theory. And there's a lot that, and you're faced with the real thing. So the, the question now is, you know what to do. And there's a lot of it in front of you. For, how do, how do you how do you make the environment now? You have people who their own is different. It doesn't is it not to use this thing, that kind of thing. But you want to to affect that. You you want to bring that mindset. I know it might take a lot of time, but what is the steps do you start with? 
Um, let me, it took a while, but recently I've realized that um, nobody wants a revolution. And that's the wrong mindset to bring into projects, especially when you are new into the project. Um, uh, nobody wants a revolution because there is something that has happened that has brought things up to that point. So when you bring a revolution, you are going to be resisted unless you have sufficient power to overcome everybody that is there and now had your input. In fact, you can overcome them and they now give you output restriction. I'm sure we, you remember output restriction from the, from the works of um, Freddie Taylor and the other fellows. So what you need to do is to go in with an open mind. Everything you know, you, it's, it's valid. It can be valid, but go into the project with an open mind. I remember a project where I was made project manager. And, you know, I just had my, I was ready with my charts and my, you know, my algorithms and everything. I'm hoping to, you know, just make that big bang change. But when I got in, I realized that there is a whole set of assumptions on my side that was wrong. So uh, don't, don't, don't try to go in um, gun blazing, you know, that way. You just come in quietly and observe first. There's an information somebody outside the project will never know, no matter how long it stays outside. Looking from that outside, you will never ever know. But when you are in that team, and you take time to understand the dynamics of the project and the priorities of the project. I hope we know that there are projects where the intention is not to make profit. And so you come in and you are trying to, you are trying to, to push profits and put, push efficiency. No, it's not going to work. So you need to get into the system, understand what that system is all about. What are the priorities of your manager, not your colleague, not your priority. Remember, they are customers, so you want to satisfy them. And if you don't like it, you can walk away. But if you are going to succeed, you have to satisfy your, your company owner, your employer, down to your direct manager. And right. that's it. Okay. I think we have uh, Engineer Risha Gwafolabi. Uh, sir, can you proceed Thank with you, your sir. question? Yeah. yeah. Can you proceed with your question, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, all. Good evening, house. Uh, this time around, I want to ask: Can you hear my voice? Yeah, yes, we, we can. can. Yeah, we can. Great. Last meeting, I struggled a lot uh, to talk. Unfortunately, I lost the opportunity to uh, talk to everyone. This time around, I thank God that it's working. However, uh, I studied industrial engineering. Uh, don't mind my, my place, I mean, my face must be dark. Unfortunately, the light is going on and off. So <laughs> please bear with me. That is never for you. Uh, I am currently in Abuja where we are uh, putting up for the um, conference of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, which coming up from 14th to 18th. And uh, uh, by, uh, by next week, people will be given opportunity, the portal will be open for everyone to um, carry out registration online. It's going to be one of the best that we are going to have. Now my question is, in engineering, who is interested in coming for the conference? How many of us have the idea that it's going to be one of the best? We have been able to beat Korean hands down when it comes to IT usage. Thanks to the, uh, the presenter who gave us this opportunity, who actually made the, the noise that industrial engineering is uh, carrying out I mean, it's going ahead to showcase the usefulness of um, IT. And uh, I also appreciate Madame that um, uh, came to represent uh, AlphaMed. 
she really did a wonderful uh, uh, brief on uh, the topic. Uh, it's good. This platform, this platform is so good, so so powerful. However, once you read industrial engineering or you have industrial engineering tools, you can do any job. That is what we were taught when we started. And uh, fortunately, I found myself in oil and gas when I started using industrial engineering tools. Then I started solving problems. My problem became a problem to me because I was being envied. Now, among those who are envying me, at the point in time, started looking for me and joining me on how to help them. Uh, uh, within a, a, a space of 10 years, I was able to uh, put six youths into leaving their um, old career or being working as helpers to become graduates through uh, mentoring, tutoring, and telling them to go back to school with the little they were earning. So, uh, however, right. my is, how many of us have, can beat his chest in industrial engineering that anywhere they put you, you will excel by using the industrial engineering tools. Whether you are in the medical, insurance, Air Force, name it, and accounting. Uh, for anyone who has not been able to do that, there is a need to go further. So now that is the question. All right. By the, by the time I finish okay. talking, All right. I want others on this forum to please come out and tell us how they have been able to use industrial engineering tools to better their own life. All right. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. The conversation definitely will continue on our platform, IPAA, WhatsApp, Twitter, also on LinkedIn. Please, we can uh, question just as engineer Afolabi have asked. Um, engineer Peter, B, you, can you make your final remarks and uh, close the presentation before we... Uh, can you do that, please? So that, uh, Thank you very much. So... Um, the first remark is, um, anybody who is in this department, I can assure you, you are in good hands. Um, it's very rare in the country to get a set of people who are dedicated. I remember as an, I, as an ISI executive, I was a um, general secretary. I remember uh, Professor Sifo. I remember Professor Ch Charles Owaba. I remember Professor um, Oluleye. I remember so many, but you are in good hands and don't waste that opportunity. Um, grab knowledge, go deeper, get resources. That's the first thing. After that, um, you know, they say wisdom is the process. Uh, I'm a Christian. They say wisdom is the principal thing, get wisdom. Then after getting wisdom, you need to get understanding. Understanding is now the practice. Either you apprentice somewhere or you make your project, for you to understand something, you need to go below the general surface. You need to get deeper by being more practical. And after that, go ahead and exploit and be the best in your profession. Um, that being said, um, as a mark of encouragement for the undergraduates, um, I run Deep Space I'm the MD Deep Space, Deep Maker Space Africa. And one of the things we offer is training in Industry 4.0. Um, so the world has gone beyond uh, manual tooling and manual production. The world is now, we are now in the digital age. Um, I have a colleague that wants, wanted to make chairs. 
she, she wanted to make furniture and she just bought the house from Russia. So, and it was it was a disappointment because but I couldn't take the brief because I was too busy. So those were the inspirations and she's having needs for more. So those were the inspirations that made us start our training in industry 4.0. So we are offering five positions for the department or anybody of their choosing or that. That's one. Then on behalf of my friends and family, I'm announcing a token of 200,000 naira for a minor. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Department. So thank you very much. Thank and you. have a great day. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, maybe you might just be on the standby. I, engineer Isaac Olani Perkun hands is up, but I can't ignore him. Sir, can you briefly ask your question, sir? Because of our time, sir, I can't ignore you, sir, but you can ask your question. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. You can unmute yourself, sir. Kindly unmute yourself. It is not a question, but to acknowledge your effort, the speaker, the organizers, the professors, we cannot clap enough for you. Well done, well done. Uh, Thank it's a you. privilege for me to be here. I think the invite only came through from uh, Professor Victor, only yesterday. And I had to look through my schedule to say, look, it is not something I want to miss. And indeed, I am chuffed with gladness for the effort and the future is good for engineers. And I want to really applaud and commend the University of Ibadan. You see, my little time that I've spent with you, it has been with reference. And I'm glad that from there, I have a lot, many of your PhD students who came here, yeah, they have passed through this house. And the friendship will continue. Well done, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you. you. I look forward for more because there is more in you. You see, remember Isaac Newton. He says, the ocean of truth lies ahead of me. So the ocean of truth, the development of our nation is in our hand. Well done. Thank, thank you, you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate you. Anyway, uh, we have a few time left. Uh, before we go, um, industrial engineers, this is the house for industrial engineers, and we, uh, you all agree with me that we're, we're taught never to mess up with goodwill, not just goodwill, positive goodwill. Uh, because it affects your reputation and relationship. So our acting dean, uh, Professor Adele K. Isaac Bangui, a professor of agricultural engineering, is supposed to give us a good message. But in absentia, Professor um, Victor Luash Naladokun will do that for him. Prof, sir, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The, the acting dean, who is also standing in for uh, our dean, Professor uh, Professor Wakulu, you are just been uh, appointed as the vice chancellor of uh, Jabu University. Uh, so he is unavoidably absent. Uh, Professor uh, Fakul, Professor Bamboye, I uh, had an, is an important engagement, so he could not come in this uh, uh, evening. Was he, he sent his uh, his, his message and uh, I, I just cropped his message and uh, I just I may show share his message to us uh, on his on his behalf yes Professor Bangboye's message he wants to he wants to appreciate and congratulate the vice chancellor of Ibadan for being part of this maiden edition, okay, and so the Department of Industrial and Production Engineering Alumni Association for this laudable uh, program, this maiden edition. He sent, he reached, he sent the apology of Professor Fakulujo who could not attend this program due to some important engagement again. 
uh, he commends the organized search of this program uh, for making it a good lecture. Uh, he appreciates and congratulates the speaker. Uh, well, he knew ahead of time, he, he prophesied that the, it's going to be a good lecture, and indeed it's a good lecture, so I can read that comment. Uh, he also believed that all participants would have been thoroughly challenged. Uh, I believe I'm also challenged, we're all challenged. So he, he sent his good message, and he hopes that all that we have discussed today will turn it around and, uh, you know, to develop our profession, develop our nation, uh, he is promising that in subsequent edition, uh, which will be what other coverage, uh, will, it, it will be. I'm sure it will be around, and uh, will make our platform very impactful. So, on behalf of Professor Bangoye, he send his good message. Thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, for the vote of thanks, the acting head of the department or department of industrial and production, okay, uh, what should give us the vote of thanks, please. H.O. Dima. Why standing on existing protocols? I must confess that it is a privilege to have been asked to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion. Dusala Bolan is my name, and I, as said by the moderator, uh, I'm the acting head of the Industrial and Production Engineering Department at present. Today, my words are not enough to express our gratitude. I would, on behalf of our great Department of Industrial and Production Engineering, University of Nevada, and the IPE Alumni Association, like to thank our guest speaker, engineer, Olatunde Peter Abe, who graced us with this thought-provoking lecture, which indeed inspired us all. Also, a hearty thank you to the Vice Chancellor Sa, who is uh, the special guest of honor for this lecture, and as well as um, Professor Pakolujo, the guest of honor, and Professor Bangoye, the acting dean, Faculty of Technology, who have all blessed us with their presence one way or the other and took out valuable time of your busy schedule. I cannot but express my deep sense of appreciation towards the chairman, Engineer Femi Akintunde, and his representative, Mrs. Wale Odufalu, as well as all other IPA executive members. In addition, I greatly appreciate the efforts of the IPA engagement team in persons of um, Professor Ladokun, Dr. Kola Wale, Dr. Dedairo, our moderator for the day, who's been working fantastically and fantastically since the commencement of the lecture, Engineer Padari and Ms. Dr. Kazim, even without leaving behind Engineer Gloria. As no program can be successful without, uh, with a single person, I particularly say a big thank you to every alumnus, alumna, and current students in attendance today. Furthermore, my appreciation goes to every other person who directly or indirectly helped me today to a huge success. Finally, I hope we all found the seminar informative and beneficial. And it is my desire that we all find a thing or two that will help us advance our careers and businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Madam HOD. I think we've come to the end of the program and then uh, hope to see us uh, next month. Uh, we have, uh, it's on us. We're focusing on next month. Uh, that's the energy transition time to get involved. Our speaker is Ajinatola um, Adiguriuye, and the event will be on 4th November 
2022. The conversation definitely will continue on our various platform. I want on this note to thank everybody across the world. Thank you for your time and uh, stay safe. Bye for now. Thank you.